hey guys and welcome to another episode of from the root to the fruit uh i am your host as always jay smith uh today's guest is a really really close friend of mine i've known this guy for over half my life i believe uh he's a doctor a business owner he's a proud owner and operator of uh oakwood chiropractic clinic uh really tremendous individual uh we're gonna sit down with him and today and kind of walk through his life what it took to get to where he is today 40 years to be an overnight success go figure uh we're gonna talk about some stories and, and chop it up a little bit uh looking forward to this conversation uh buckle up it's gonna be a good one Dr. Mike, thank you. It feels uh, clandestine and odd calling you Dr. Mike, but I'll call you Dr. Mike because damn it, you didn't go to school for absolutely nothing. <laughs> Welcome to the show. Thank you for coming on. How are things, sir? Jay, things are great, man. We miss you back here in North Carolina. Interesting oh. that that you're in Vegas while I'm in Raleigh, and, and and this is how we ended up right now. So, well, I mean, that's you know, life has a a strange sense of humor sometimes. Uh, so, so tell me, uh, tell me about this journey, brother. Like, I mean, start at the beginning. We're going to dive right into it. We're not going to, we're not going to mess around. This is good. This is going to be a big one. Well, uh, I think it's only fair to start with, uh, you know, the whole journey would have begun about the time I met you, Jay. And, uh, that had to be around 19, 20 years ago. Now it was good. I mean, it's amazing. It's amazing that it's been that long since I've known you. And, uh, uh, let's see. I mean, just from the time I met you, I did finish in college because, I mean, teenage years is, is looking back at the time. I knew it all. Now, looking back, <laughs> I'm <just> a freaking <laughs> idiot. <laughs> but aren't, so, aren't we all? I mean, that's, that's, I mean the, that's the story of the deal, right? Slowly finding out that maturity isn't becoming more smart. It's finding out exactly how stupid you are. And so that's a pretty that, – that, that lesson has taken a long time to sink in. So – uh, well, hell, Jay, I met you bartending, and we were at, yep. at Jillian's downtown, which is now a church of all things. Um, I've, uh, if one place needed some holy water <laughs> and some cleansing, <laughs> I don't know if that, that was the bad thing for that place. No, we, we, it, took, it took some scrubbing, I think, to make that place holy. So, um, dude, started, started everything. Uh, really Jillian's kicked it off, man. I was, I was just being a freaking kid before then. And, uh, thought I was going to just make a million dollars real quick, real easy. And found out that wasn't always the case because people that have millions of dollars, they don't just give it up. And once I, I know you, you just think they would just hand them out. I mean, but, it, but it, let's, it, let's talk about that. Like, I, and when I met, when we met, right. Like, um, studious you seemed very determined uh my first impressions of you were very you you knew what you wanted and you knew what it was going to take even if you didn't you exuded that right like you you exuded that you knew what it was going to take to get there uh, i i always had a tremendous regard for that uh just the way you carried yourself with it, almost regal if, if that makes sense like you it, it comes off and I get that sometimes like it comes off like it's cocky, but it's not like I already know the end of this sentence. So right. like that kind of thing. Right. Well, the the key to looking back to my early 20s when I was working as hard as I was working is, is I was feigning ignorance because I thought it was I thought it was just going to happen because I am a me and and it's going to happen for no other reason. Right. And so I saw no reason not to just be myself and work hard. What's fascinating is that as I got older, I started to realize that that being just me wasn't enough. Like I had to, I had to work very hard and I had to. So it, it was this, it was this awkward sort of, uh, we'll say epiphany that was the, I was working as hard as I could work thinking that, that that was all it took. But I didn't know I was working as hard as I could work because I just figured that's what would happen because that's what I did. But then I also took that for granted because I didn't understand that that's not how everyone processed things. And then as, as, as reality started to set in as I, and as I got older and as I got more mature and as I found out that I'm actually an idiot, I, I said, okay, 
just because I'm working very hard doesn't mean I'm going to get where I got to go. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's like a ham run on a hamster wheel, just running. And you, I'm working really hard on this hamster wheel. Why am I not getting anywhere? And so then, it, then once the ignorance is gone and your naivete is gone, and then you realize that you're just running on a hamster wheel, it's like, well, wait a second. What exactly does it take for me to get to where I got to go? So I worked really hard when I was a kid and I still do, but when I was a kid, it was interesting that I, I seemed to be talking it into existence, which is, which we'll get to it. We've come full circle is, is I've had to manifest your own destiny, but I did it ignorantly in my twenties. Right. Now I'm doing, now I'm doing intentfully knowing that it doesn't just, you work very hard. Like that's a large component of it, but that's not just, Oh, just work very hard. And here's a million dollars. It just doesn't work that way. And when I first met you, Jay, we were working in arguably the most popular uh, bar and nightclub in downtown Raleigh. And I, I was gifted to have that, that opportunity. And I, I didn't, I, I, I was very, to, to use your word, arrogant and cocky. I was like, well, of course I got the job. I mean, I'm me, so I should get that job. And then looking back, I realized how incredibly lucky I was to get that job. And it was a blessing. And I pissed a lot of people off by getting that job because I jumped, I jumped a bunch of guys in line that had been busting their hump to get that opportunity. And, and in my head, I was like, oh, well, you just didn't work hard enough. And that's, that's not that, that's that cockiness that I think I was able because, but it's because I was so ignorant to it. It was, it was easy to, to misinterpret as, anything other than genuine, authentic grit and determination. But um, starting in the bars and uh, then I graduated, got a degree in business and decided, oh, well, I'll just go into business because I have a degree. I mean, what, what, what else would you do? <laughs> so, <laughs> and I went straight into sales and hated it. I hated it. It was terrible. And then I said, why am I doing this? I'm 23. Uh, I'm, I'm not married. I got no kids. Why am I, why am I doing something I hate? Let's go back to the bars. And then I went back to the bars, got lucky for a year and a half, and found a great job with another hot spot, hot spot downtown. Lost that job for no reason of my own. And then I floundered around. And that's when you and I really started to both meld and clash. And both of those things were building blocks towards you know, our relationship has just come to be today. And then I finally said, you know what, if I'm not careful, I'm going to be a 47 year old bartender and I got to do something to fix that. And so that's when I started to understand I'm an idiot. And just because I'm a good bartender, or a good bar manager, because I've got a job at a nice hot spot downtown, like that's not enough anymore because those are short lived. They're fleeting. They're superficial. But when you're stuck in the moment and you can't see outside yourself, all you see is the lights and the shimmering and the, the money and, and, and you're popular because you're popular by default. So no fault of your own, right? Or by no, by no, uh, let's say no attribute to yourself. And it's very easy to conflate that popularity with intelligence. And that, that was a, that was a, 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 a I think something that set me up for my, my come to Jesus moment, which was I couldn't get a job in the bar industry. I had been in it for six years. I was super good at it. And I just, I couldn't buy a job. And I said, all right, well, then I gotta, I gotta make a call here. I either gotta go head first into, into this, or I gotta, I gotta find a career that's going to sustain me and allow me to have the things that I want for the rest of my life because I've worked next to 47 year old bartenders and as great a people, they, they, they still lived week to week. They were doing the exact same thing I was doing I'm, at 24. I'm, I'm pretty sure now they're, uh, they're, they're in their fifties. They might still be pushing Heineken's. Not for I'm pretty, not, I'm not pretty sure not that there's anything wrong with that. That's not, not what at I all. Mean. But if, not at if, all. That's, if that's not your heart's desire and, and you, you seek to be or have, or to accumulate more then yes, that's, mm -hmm. that's, fucking terrible <laughs> but it's the misconception that 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 something will change right that's that's that that you're 24 and pushing heineken's it's the misconception that by 44 you're just going to magically own the bar and you're going to magically have you know something like something's going to get better because you worked very hard at, at it and the service industry is very difficult to escape. And it, it, hell, I didn't, I didn't really escape it until just a few years ago. And, um, 
it's, it's attractive for a lot of reasons, but growing up, I was just like, ah, I'm just really good at this. So I, I'll just wait for the job offers to come rolling in. And when they didn't, man, it was a, uh, it was a massive lesson, uh, in, in how, how much, how much little maturity I actually have. So well, that's, that's fair. I think we, we all grow, right. We all grow through. Not, not everyone grows at the same rate, but, but we all grow through and, and become our, our best selves at some point, right? Sooner, sooner rather than later, we all hope. Uh, but right. one, one of the, the greatest things I genuinely appreciated about you knowing you is your, aside from your kindness, your work ethic. Where did, where did that derive from? Like I've, I, I have a natural drive, but it, I've, I tapped into it and, and made it more finite. The older I got, the more responsibilities that were lumped onto my plate, but you seem to naturally have that. Where, where, did, where did that originate from? My mom and dad, they, I was, I was raised by two people that um, made sure that I fell a lot and now they made sure to catch me, but they weren't going to prevent me from falling. And that, that taste of, not failure. Failure is the wrong word. My mom and dad never truly let me fail, but they let me taste defeat. And when you feel that as a, as a kid, when you're seven, eight, nine, ten, and mostly in sports, back when there was no participation ribbons or or just everyone got a trophy. Do, do you and, mean do you mean the good old days? <laughs> I mean the good old days. Okay. When when if let it out, remember how this feels. Don't let it happen again. And it, it was a lesson more so than losing is now, I think, considered a punishment for. Right. Uh, and maybe I don't. And, and I've, I've been so far disconnected from from youth sports that I, I, I maybe things are changing. I would imagine they would be. Uh, but as far as I'm concerned, when I was when I was young, you know, my mom and dad were like, well, if you want if you want comic books and you want video games, uh, you need to get your own money. And so I'd go mow lawns and, and, and I got a paper route and I was making 30 bucks a week. Like, as, nice at, it in, I know <laughs> at 14, 14, 15 years old, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm under the, I'm under the threshold for uncle Sam to come take any extra money out of my pocket. Uh, hey, so hey, whatever, candy, whatever candy in here you want, yeah. pick it out. Yep. Got this. But not the king size. I got the, no, no, I got, no, that's on you. If you want this. Yeah. We're, <laughs> I just said 30 bucks a week, not 30 bucks a day, which right now still sounds like a lot of money. So it does. <laughs> Bro, but then when it got to, then when it got to uh, working in jobs where the competitive nature of the industry was the determining factor of success, that's when I was like, okay, we got to buckle down and, and, and I can't allow someone else to outwork me, which happens all the time. But it, if, if someone beats me, I, I like to say, if you, if you beat me in a mile race, you beat me by one step. And if you did, you better catch your breath because we're going to run it back because I, I, can't, I can't handle that. And that sort of attitude, while it, it's, it's, it's not, it's not a, something you can keep up in, in perpetuity, it, 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 it's, it's also not realistic to think you should be undefeated for the rest of your life at all things at all times. It's not realistic, but striving to be undefeated is 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 acceptable with regards to you know maintaining a, a, a realistic attitude towards defeat which is defeat should not be taken to a personal level that makes the individual feel as though they are less than the winners that that's simply the outcome of that situation and that is very important to compartmentalize especially when you're used to winning all the time and when i was a kid I went, I, I would win all the time. And then when I lost, I would lie to myself and say, it doesn't matter. You won anyway, which is a double-edged sword because one, no, you didn't, but two, it kept you pushing. But, you know, as again, as you get older, I didn't get smarter. I just, I just realized I was, you know, that those, those misinterpretations or those misrepresentations of the truth um, have negative effects that I, I think can actually branch out into other areas of, of life that aren't just competitive based. But that's fair. The uh, I, I think that's I, that's my blessing and also my curse. I feel the same way. 
exactly the same way. The only caveat I would put on that is if you beat me, you're going to have to keep beating me. Right. And I'm going to get better. Like it's, I internalize it and I'm going to have right. to now dig deep, find another channel, but I'm going to get you. We're going right. to, we're going to do this until I get you. Then I'm going to figure out how a bit. We, we both know this. We played enough Mario Kart together. <laughs> so we both understand. It's been some, some 4 a.m. Mario Kart wars. Uh, Bunch is thrown. Yeah. Like things happen because it, it, one of us has got to lose or not win right. that day. However, you know, like it, it's it's a deal. But I, I think right. all the all those things are good, and they push you to want to get better, to be your best. Because at the end of the day, yeah, I want to be undefeated, bitch. Even if I lost today, I can be undefeated tomorrow. I can go- right. <laughs> right, and it's and it's just making sure that uh, it, you know what. You take if you take if you take losses personal, and it, it's it's kind of glamorized by by professional sports that I took that loss personally or the boxing or fighting or whatever. And the concept is is very Hollywood and very dramatic. I think that there's that it might actually end up doing more harm than good in the long run. But you don't find that out until you've you've been just defeated and defeated. And I'd rather, bro, I'd rather lose on a field goal in double overtime. I'd rather lose that game that we pushed them all the way to the limit, took everything they had to beat us, than win a hundred to three. Like winning a hundred to three, there's no value, there's no growth, there's no benefit. No one, no one, it's 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 a it's a waste of time. And so every time you have an opportunity to put yourself in a position for competition, you should put yourself up against someone that should beat you. And when, the, when they do, you get to find out one of two things. You're not as good as them, or they had to work very hard. Those are our, our learning points. And both of those things translate into everything that you and I have done in the last 20 years. And none of it's easy, bro. None of it's easy. It's so freaking, it's so tough. <laughs> None of it. None of it. It's not, it's almost not fair. And as much as I hate the statement, you know, if it was easy, everyone would do it, which I don't think is true. Uh, I, I don't personally believe that that's a, a broad brush statement that can be used across all facets. But I, I, every time something very difficult comes along and I accomplish it, I now realize it's like, man, that was really hard. If it was easy, would I still have done it? I mean, I mean, some, sometimes, like I said, a hundred to three victory, like that was easy. Like what I, like how many days can you win a hundred to three before you're like, I don't want to play anymore. You know, like where's the growth. So that's fair. That's fair. Let's, uh, let's, let's, I want to, I want to hear about, and I know them and I, I have held them in high regard, like salt of the earth, high regard, uh, the rents, the parents, what, what is going on? Like, tell me, tell me about a day in the, I've been a day in the life in your house, but yeah. I have not been a day in the life in your house growing up. Tell me about that. Sunday dinners, man. Well, I mean, of course I had my younger brother and sister, but uh, mom and dad are doing well right now. Uh, they live there a, a, a 60 second walk that way. And I, I, I got a, I got a nice little, I was very blessed to have my mom. I wouldn't, I'd be somewhere, but I wouldn't be here without my mom. Like that includes everything. I wouldn't have, my practice, I would not be standing in this house exactly. I, I'm, I'm gonna you know. throw some love for real. I don't know if I'd be here if it wasn't for your mom. Yeah, and I mean that, she's, like in the real, and like I mean that, like for real. She's just really. I mean, it's hard to find good people, but it's difficult to find amazing people. Well, what's been a blessing is that one, I didn't get to choose my parents, right? And yeah. they didn't get to choose me, so I, I got, I got. You can say lucky, I guess, but. I also, just because you didn't choose your parents doesn't mean you have to stay with your parents your whole life. I mean, I'm 40 and I, I, I see my parents, I treat my mom and dad once a week, like in my practice, they, I am their primary care physician. Like I get the opportunity to make sure that if they have any problems or issues or concerns, I'm the first person that they call. And that's, that's twofold. It's one, it's, I get to pay my parents back for them taking care of me and helping me get here. So I'm able to, you know, their investment is me is now paying dividends off for them but I get to maintain a relationship with my parents. That's, I still, it still blows my mind when I was in college and it would be spring break, fall break. And, and my roommates would bitch that, Oh man, I got to go home to my parents. I look and be like, I, I can't wait to go home to my parents. I mean, I, I, I love my mom and dad. 
they're a, you know annoying as parents can be, but because they're more because they're my parents than more so than my friends, which they're supposed to be. And I think that 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 attribute is lost, which is one thing that I really respect about you, Jay. I see how you you know you're a father to your kids. You're not their friend, and and you shouldn't be. And I and I think that that is slowly being lost, and it's shame to see because I think it's what's creating the mentality that as a child you should be coddled because everyone needs to be a winner. I don't know, but mom and dad are doing great. Uh, growing up with them was a trip. Um, my dad is, is, has, he did, he, he, he came at me years later and he said, Michael, I did the best I could with you. And, you know, but when I'm a kid, I'm like, my dad is my dad and he's Superman and, and what can he do wrong? And, and then he, he, as I get older and I'm you now I'm, I'm a, you know, I'm 40 and that doesn't make any sense. Uh, he's able to say, Hey, well, I was scared when I had to punish you or, or I didn't know exactly how to congratulate you on a victory without making you feel like, you were, you know, the best on the planet because you're not. But to hear him say, I struggled to be a parent was very fascinating because as a kid, you know, when you have a, when you come from a good family and a good household, all you know is your parents are superheroes. And I mean, my mom, my mom though, might actually be a superhero. I'm not convinced that she doesn't just wear a costume at night and go save, go, go destroy criminals. <laughs> I'm 96% sure. On the Netflix, I yeah, exactly right. So my mom, my mom is great. And I love my mom to death. Um, pops too, but yeah, man. And, and I have to say everything I have, again, I would be somewhere if it wasn't for if, without them, but I, I would not be here. There's no way, man. I mean, I'm, I'm, I, I don't know why I got decided to be one of their kids, but I, I, I was blessed. And it, you know, what's interesting and, and really great is that as I look forward to becoming a father, hopefully in the next 10 years, you know, I'm, I'm hoping to be half the parents my parents were. And that's a really powerful thing for me to realize. I, I have to make sure that my kids can't wait to see me at spring break when they go to college. I want to make sure that they love to have me around and natural tendencies of kids. There'll be a, there'll be a gap in time, 13 to 17 or something where they'd rather be with their friends than with me, but it's not personal. That's just being a teenager. I remember those days it had nothing to do with my parents, you know, and I just got to hope I don't cry too much about it, but you know, that, that'll be, that's, that's probably going to happen on the next podcast whenever that takes place. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. The, uh, the decision, right? Like we, we talk about that. You said you pivoted from uh, business and in the chiropractor, but there, there's a time that you lived in my city. Tell me, tell me a little bit about that. Well, when I decided to go, so I went into medicine when I was, I said, I got to do something. I got to go into medicine. And as you remember, when I was 26, I got braces again for the second time. And I got braces for six months. And my, that was because of my mom. My mom said, your smile's crooked. We need braces again. And she said she'd pay for them. So she did. And I got to have the wonderful experience of being a 26 a, a year old with with top and bottom braces. And, uh, but as I was getting them, I started talking to my orthodontist and I was like, what do you, what do you do? Like, how, what is this? What is this life you live? And then I said, okay, well, if I'm going to break off the service industry, I got to find a, a career that's going to be relatively stable and what's more stable than medicine, but it's very naive. There's been no medical doctors, physicians of any kind in my family. I also was very, um, will say naive as to uh, I either had to be a bartender or a doctor. And uh, I had, that didn't have a lot of education on that. And that, that that's probably um, something that I wish I had had more of not regretting anything, but I definitely didn't know that I could be a ditch digger and make a hundred grand a year. You know, I mean, it's, it's out there. I could be a plumber, an electrician. Like, I just, I don't know. It was just very fascinating. I said, no, I have to be a professional. I have to be educated. And you got to go to school for 15 years. And of course that's not true, but it helps. <laughs> it does. It does help. Right. Right. And so, and so when I started to pursue medicine, I was initially, I, I could argue and probably say with honesty, I was pre dental, but the medical schools of all kinds in this country, whether it be, medical school, dental school, farm school, osteopathic school, chiropractic, physical therapy, they all have 90% of the same prerequisites. So as soon as you say you're, you're just pre-med. And so I went back to school, my mom's mom uh, paid for my return back to NC State where I took biology 101 and chem 101 and all that crap. 
I know, dude, I was, and you know, I was, I was four years removed from graduation. So, um, cause I was just trying to build my resume and, uh, and get into, to, to, to dental schools. Um, anyway, I ended up applying to UNC's dental school and I got an interview, but I, looking back, I now realized it was a pity interview. I was like the, the, the 350th person interviewed out of 351 and they accepted 80, you know? So, right. I mean, it was, a, it was a token and they got my 250 bucks for the interview, but, um, I then went, I, I, I talked to the school when I didn't get in. I said, Hey, I'm going to apply again next year. What do I going to do to get in? And the advisor I spoke to was, was classic Chapel Hill. And the guy was like, really, I'm surprised you got an interview. And I was like, well, that's awesome. You don't like them anyway. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I can't tar holes. Go, go pack. Well, right, for real. I mean, this is our year. Said every NC State fan ever. Ever. Uh, every ever. year. Nope. <laughs> go walk through the halls of Burga during March and NC State's winning every March Madness tournament. And doesn't matter. Doesn't matter our seed. Doesn't matter our ranking. Means nothing. We don't even need to be in the tournament. They're going to write us in. They're going to vote us in. And we're going to make it to the finals. And we're going to win. And it's going to happen. This is it, though. This year. You'll see. You'll see. We, we were uh, in NIT two years, and I did pick NC State to win the NCAA tournament. I mean, because if you win the NIT, you actually get you, you, you get into the final four of the that, of the that NC2A. Should actually, that should actually be a thing, I think. How like if, sick. If you, if you win the NIT, you should, like, be you, – you should be in a play-in somewhere. Yeah, you get, you get into the Elite Eight, at least minimum. You know at what least, I mean? At least. At least. Uh, so, um, yeah, go pack. <laughs> so, uh, UNC said no go, and I was like, okay, uh, where can I go to school to get a medical degree of any kind that I'll appreciate? So, I started doing my homework, and I, I, I got to go out of state. All, dude, all the medical schools in, in, in North Carolina are just super competitive, and I was coming in five years late doing a, a, a career change, and just the, the academia for medical schools is so wrought with it, it's almost unjust it, 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 I, I'd have been a, I'd have been a, I'd have been a great physician it doesn't matter what you made me whether I was doing hand surgery boob jobs replacing crowns it didn't matter you know what I mean like I'd have been uh, great no matter what it was boob jobs would have been cool I'm a, that would have been that. awesome I'll say not nah, you know what I'm saying but I'm saying mm -hmm. that would no, you know what I'm saying I, I know I, I'm hearing what you're saying and I agree with it, but I'd have been great. I'd have, I'd have been great at any of those things, but they just make it very difficult to get in. And so I said, okay, then I have to go find a school that let me in. And I, I was able to target three schools, university of Florida Gators, um, university of Nevada, Las Vegas, and like some school in Colorado, but um, the, the, the uh, counselor at, at Vegas said, bro, it's going to be tough, but we can get you in. Come on out, move to Vegas, gain residency, get a job, um, work for 12 months, start taking some prereqs, get a biology degree, and I'm pretty sure we'll be able to get you into our dental school. And I was like, cool, let's go. Plus, I wanted to live in Las Vegas for a hot minute. Uh, I've never, you know, it's, it's a great city. And and I at the time, I was 26, 27. So uh, worked hard for North Carolina for two years, moved to Vegas uh, 2009, and started working my butt off. And that's a lot. That's a lot where that work ethic came into play because I was rejected from the first twelve jobs I applied for because I was trying to go. I was trying to work on the strip and work in the billion dollar casinos. And I wanted. I said I can do this. I'm, I'm a good worker, but can't get hired without experience. Can't get experience without a job. So that old catch twenty two. You know, which by the way, always bet twenty two on the roulette table. It hits always. every time. Oh, every last. Every Difficult to get a job. You're out here. Smacking babies, kicking midgets in the face. What what was the, what was the beginning of the turnaround? Well, I moved to Vegas. Oh, the big oh, the beginning was a very very clear moment, and I've said this to a few people, and I'll never forget it for the rest of my life. So I moved to Vegas, two thousand eight. Exactly two months after the the crash. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the best time to move to a city that's dependent on the economy, you know. <laughs> And, uh, but I got to Vegas because I was working at Chili's at the time, if you remember. And yeah. Chili's is nothing but wonderful things to say about Chili's. Uh, in fact, that one by my house, bro, they shut her down and they moved it to Morrisville. And it's now a, a, it's now a cool little tequila bar. But, um, oh, they left all the, all the 
tables and chairs in there. If you walk in, it's a Chili's, just a different restaurant with all the Chili's gear in it. It's kind of cool. Um, but I was able to go to, so I was able to have a job in Vegas when I moved immediately, but I was working at a Chili's, but they start you at the bottom pretty standard. So I was getting two shifts a week, making, you know, hundred bucks a week, if that, Nothing. but the whole time, the whole time I'm trying to get a job at the casinos. And so at the, this was when the internet was just starting to be all online applications. So you had to, you go online, you'd see who they're hiring for, you'd click, you'd give them your resume, you'd fill out their questionnaire, and then you'd wait to hear from them. And I did that for about six weeks and just kept getting no response, no response, no response, no response. And I said, okay, I have to do something. So I started going to the casinos and going into specifically the poker rooms is what I was applying for. Is the manager on duty? Yes. Can I meet them, please? Absolutely. It was in, in, in regard to, I'm trying to get a job. Will you apply online? I said, I have applied online and I have not gotten a job. Therefore, I'd like to talk to the manager. And I did this in eight, nine casinos, poker rooms. And I finally got one of the managers uh, in Mandalay Bay, <clears throat> which unfortunately ended sour. But this woman looked at me and said, in, in three years since we've been doing online, no one's ever come to me to ask for a job. Everyone just applies online. And I said, well, you rejected me and I want, a, I want a job. She goes, well, you don't have experience in the casino and you need some. So go get, her recommendation was go get any job. And I said, okay. So I started looking at other casino jobs. Um, and I ended up getting a job as a ticket, uh, a sports ticket writer at Bally's in Paris. And that's how I was able to get my gaming license which allowed me to then say I've worked in a casino, I'm hireable, right? Which means I've gone through the background check, fingerprints are in the system, like you're in the system, right? But once you've done it once, you have now proven to all the other casinos that you're hireable. So now you are no longer a risk because they have to invest money into your, into your onboarding. So I got that job. I worked the, full, the first football season there. And then Mandalay Bay hired me as a, as a part-timer and I was able to work there. Um, I got two shifts a week usually graveyard, awful shifts, 1 a.m. to 9 a.m., just terrible, and busted my hump. Yeah, it was awful, bro. And uh, when you were at the bottom of the totem pole, you just get the shifts that you get. No no, no rhyme or reason. You could work graveyard one day and then, then uh, uh, day shift the next day. Like, you know what I mean? Like, it, it was oh, – yeah. they, just, they just gave you what was left over without rhyme or reason. Anyway, I also, I kept applying for the jobs because I'm only getting two shifts a week. Yeah, we got to eat, and, yeah. Exactly. So anyway, then um, I'm still applying for other jobs. I'm pounding the pavement and I head into the Venetian because I knew the Venetian was a great poker room. And I go to the Venetian. I say, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a part-timer at Mandalay Bay. I'd like an opportunity to be a dealer because at, at Mandalay Bay, I was just a brush. A brush is basically like an assistant to the assistant manager. No management responsibilities at all, but you're the gopher of the gopher. You're the just the absolute bottom ringer. Right? right. And so, but it's a start and I got in. So that was a big thing. I went to, I went to Venetian and I got an audition to be a dealer. Dude, I went to dealer school. It's one of those kind of unspoken, but made fun of frowned upon. It's like going to bartending schools. Like anyone who goes to bartending school, I'm never hiring them. First of all, that's stupid. But second of all, it's that mentality, which is you shouldn't have to learn how to be a bartender. You just are. I mean, that's okay. But if you don't know what's in a kamikaze, you don't know what's in a kamikaze. Like at yes. some point you have to learn, right? So uh, I went to bartending school. Uh, sorry, I went to dealer school, applied, got an audition. I went to this audition. I killed it. I killed it. I know I did. I killed it. I get an, I get a rejection email the next day and, and, I was sitting in my second bedroom on West Russell Road, a bedroom you've slept in, and I was staring at my I was staring at my computer and I was reading this email and I said out loud to the computer, no one in my house. I looked at it, I said, I disagree. And I printed out the email and I went straight to the poker room at the Venetian. And I said, I did an audition yesterday. I'd like to speak to the manager that that supervised my audition. And they said, well, he's not working today. He'll be here tomorrow. I said, what's his name? They told me his name. I said, I'm, I'll be back tomorrow. I came back the next day. The gentleman was there. And I said, hey, man, uh, I auditioned for a role. I, I, I really think you made a mistake in turning me down. 
I'd like for you to reconsider. Um, and if you don't, please tell me what I did wrong so that when I apply next time, I do, I get the job. And he said, bro, I've auditioned 200 people in, in 12 hours, which is probably true. <laughs> and, uh, and I, and he said, give me your name. Let me look you up. And we'll figure it out. And so I said, okay, so come back tomorrow. I came back the next day and he, he, I walked in and he said, okay, I looked you up. He said, I just made a note that you talked too much. So I just wrote you off, but I got to tell you in five years, I've never had somebody come back and fight me. So, uh, I'm going to give you the job. If you fuck up once you're out. And I said, <laughs> it was like, right. You're dead. <laughs> <laughs> and then I got the job and this was seasonal because they do their seasonal tournaments, you know, their deep stacks. And then, um, at the end of the, by, by the end of it, dude, I worked so hard at that job. I took, I didn't take my breaks. I stayed in the room and I cleaned up. I got chips. Like I did, I was, a, I, 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 I helped, I helped. I did everything. I, I sat players. I got, I did everything I could. And I said, I'm not, I'm not eating. Like I, I'm, I, I get to work two days a week for eight hours max. I'm not going to leave until I'm not going to leave. And so, and at the end of it, they offered me a part-time job year round. And she worked for six weeks, you get three months off. For six weeks, you get three months off. Like that's almost worse than just getting two shifts, two garbage shifts a week at the Mandalay Bay, right? For sure. And so I I didn't grease the wheels per se, but I started making it so the managers knew my name without my name tag. I said, no, no, no. These managers are going to know who I am. And dude, I, 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 I got offered a, a part-time position after one deep stack. And again, I was the only one they, they picked up for part-time out of the 250 dealers. And um, I, I, at that point, at that point, what I was able to do is I was able to, to kind of break down and cry about it because I realized how hard that was. And that's something I would have taken for granted when I was 22, three, four thinking, Oh, that's just what I do. And I understand the confidence factor, but you also have to really appreciate the, the realization of hard work and it's, it's yeah. And so, and so I didn't take my hard work for granted, but anyway, so I got a job at the Venetian and I was working part-time. And then within a month I was, I was on the floor uh, dual rate. And then within another month, I was on the floor full time. And then within another month, they were saying, do you want to apply for the full time job? And I said, well, I'm in school. No, but thank you. And so within five months, I got four promotions. And again, busting my hump. There's not one person that outworked me in that room for that, 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 those four months, not one. And I'll, and I'll go toe to toe. And there were some really hard workers in there. And I didn't win every day, but I won a lot of days. And, uh, but I was going to school. And finally, I was able to get in-state tuition, and I was able to take full-time classes. And at this point, I had quit Mandalay Bay. I got a job at a local casino on the south side of the Strip called the M, which is a fabulous resort. You should definitely go there if you have the means. Uh, it's about eight miles south of the, the Big Black Pyramid. Um, beautiful, beautiful, small local resort. And uh, so I was working two part-time jobs, working about 80 hours a week and going to school. And when I started, the, but I was going to school part-time, and I was able to go to school full-time. And I had my first round of exams and bombed them all. And that's when I, I called my dad and I said, dad, I got to make a move, man. I either, I got to, I got to either take out loans and go to school full time and focus on this career or Venetian wants me to go full time, which is a, a, a lifelong career with benefits and good money. But you know, the, the gaming industry is the bar industry on steroids and it's not wrong but I was working next to people who were 55, 65, 70 years old, who had been working in Vegas for 40 years, and they were miserable because they couldn't get out. They're making 75, 85,000 a year, and they have their skill set doesn't translate to anything. So if they were to leave and start, they would be starting over, and that's a hard pill uh, to swallow. So I had to make the really the crying call to leave the Venetian and, and pursue school full-time. 
And that's about the time that the president of Texas Chiropractic College came and did a presentation at the University of, of Nevada, Las Vegas. And I was forced to go to his presentation due to the fact that I was in the pre, pre-med club. And if you didn't show up, they'd ding you. And, and if they dinged you, it would eventually get out to the admissions board and that you weren't fully blah, 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 blah. Well, I had a big test to study for and I was going to skip it, but I saw you got free pizza. It's funny how that works. And so I went, I went to get free pizza and soda and I didn't listen to a thing this president said for the first half hour, but the second half hour I listened and he said, Hey, there's a chiropractic convention in town. That's why we're here. So we're doing this talk. If you'd like to be a guest, here's my cell phone number, please contact me and you'll be my guest. And I said, okay, what the hell? And I texted the guy and I was like, Hey, I'd like to go. And he goes, of the 150 students, you're the only one who sent me a text. And I said, okay, let's, let's go do that. So I could hang out with him. He said, apply, let's see what happens. I applied, I got in. Um, small misconception and a misnomer about chiropractic college is anyone can get in, which is not exactly true, but it's a much more liberal acceptance process. But unlike, me- unlike medical schools, their attrition rate is near 66%. And so uh, this whole argument of anyone could get into chiropractic college be like, yes, but not everyone can graduate. And that's, that's where it's lost in, in, in translation to the lay person. But, uh, I was, I, I had to end my tenure in Vegas, went to Houston. I was very quick to, to grab the president of my class status and spent the next three and a half, four years just grinding as hard as I could. And I was able to graduate. And then, uh, all, these, all these roads seem seem like they start and end the same way with that break neck work ethic. And and, and I, I'm going to agree to disagree with you on that space for confidence I found in my life. My confidence comes from the fact that I've already made up my mind. I'll do whatever it takes for whatever right. this task is. Right. So... You, you're not going to break me. I might lose to, to your, our earlier discussion, right? I might lose today, mm-hmm. but it ain't going to be a, a bunch of days you glue together that I'm going to get beat. So we're going to mm-hmm. keep, keep at it, and you're just going to have to keep beating me. And one of us right. is going to get sick of it, and the damn sure ain't going to be me. Right. And uh, quitting is not an option. Like no. getting, beat, getting beat every day is an option, mm-hmm. and getting beat down every day is an option. And, but quitting is not an option. And it's a very, it's, it's, it's a very, like, again, it's not, and and it's, it's, it's in the context that this is not a sport. So it's not like you, you're going to go undefeated, uh, 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 no wins for the season. Right. And then you lose funding. No, it's, it just is, is you have an attempt and all right, well, this attempt didn't work. I'm going to try again tomorrow and 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 tomorrow. And eventually I'm going to do it. And what's happened is the confidence isn't, oh, I'm just going to do it because it's easy. The confidence is, oh, I'm going to do it because I don't fail. But yes. that, that not failing isn't a foregone conclusion. It's a, no, I'm going to work hard. I'm going to have the tenacity, have the grit, have the determination. And I don't care what, if I figure out if I don't succeed today, all I did was find another way to fail. So don't, so let's not do that again. Let's attempt, let's do it another way. And if that doesn't work, we'll do it another way and another way. And eventually it's going to work out, which is how uh, people are successful in spite of themselves because they don't give a shit about failure. And so it's very interesting to me how somebody who has just blind determination, blind, Let's just, let's say there's a problem and there's a hundred possible outcomes and only one of them is correct. Someone with blind determination will just line up those hundred options and they'll just try one. Did that work? No. Let's go to two. Did that work? No. Let's go to three. No. But you, and, and what's interesting is if, if it's option 98 that works, they'll go, oh my God, it was 98. I should have started on this end. Okay. Got it. Let's move on. What the really smart people do or the people with outward determination to think that they are are superior, that have this cocky, arrogant mentality is they take defeats personally and they take those hundred options of, of, uh, they take those hundred options and they'll assess them all individually and then they'll gauge them and they'll rank them and they'll rank them in a, okay, this is most likely going to be the best option. And then this one, this one, this one, this one. And if they're wrong, after like eight failures, they'll quit. 
because they're like, I'm an idiot and this isn't fun and I'm smarter than this. And if I keep trying and I keep failing, everyone's going to think I'm stupid. But if they would just keep going, eventually they'll get that to that solution. But that solution isn't meant to be like, there's, there's no reason why that solution should be the first attempt. And there's no reason why that solution should be able to be predicted or figured out with any regularity that would give someone an, a, an upper hand, which is why you and I have both worked for absolute monkeys at bars and at restaurants, and they are successful and they make, they make a lot of money. And you're like, how do you make so much money? You're an idiot. And what you don't see is that they will do all 100 options shamelessly. And once they get the solution, they're like, solution and then they go on to the next one they don't care if they got 99 wrong the first time they got the solution so you know what that means they're going to be successful that can be that's that's a very jealous thing because you don't you don't necessarily see the 99 things they got wrong in order to get that one that one right answer that one and then but see when they get it they don't necessarily brag that they got it they're just like i knew there was a solution that was it all right next what's the next problem let's get that one done and that's determination. That's the grit. That's the grit, and 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 that's a characteristic that, if you have that, you know, it's hard to watch somebody who's an idiot, but very determined succeed. It's hard because you you want to you want to you want to watch them fail because they're just stupid, but that's not fair because you don't have to be intelligent to succeed. You just have to get it. Right. You don't have to. Yeah, just once. So. Um, going through my my trials and tribulations it's it's an adage that i didn't i didn't coin but i wish i had but it's it's i didn't get better it didn't get easier sorry the adage was edit that the adage was it doesn't um it doesn't get easier you just get better at it yeah that's a, that's and a yeah right that was like, it comes so easy for you. I was like, do you know how many wrong answers I had to get in order for this to happen? It's like, I don't know the answer because I'm smart. I know the answer because I've gotten it wrong a hundred times. So that, that's that not. Is, the... that, that is what I, I convey as a parent. I'm like, I'm not telling you this because I'm holier than thou. And I'm, <laughs> you know, I'm telling you this because I messed it up the most. It could be a lot. Up. And a this, lot. This little path right over here in the thicket. That's the one you want. Hey, you know what? But, and that's being a parent. If you don't believe me, you know what? Try the other 99. Let's see how that works out okay. for you. Hit yep. It. Keep it. fishing. Keep it. fishing. <laughs> I'm not going to hand you this fish. You just keep throwing that hook in the water. We'll just see what happens. Oh, was it what I said? Weird. You want to listen to me next time? No, that's cool. I'll be here when you fall. I'll be here when you fall. That's real. Yes, yeah, sir. Yes, yeah, sir. But, that's you know. I decided to start my own practice right out of school, which uh, you have two options when you graduate from a chiropractic college. You either join another practice, you become an associate, and you get paid dirt, uh, but, you, but you learn how to run a practice. Um, hopefully, you, you get hired by somebody who is, has gone, has learned, the, has, 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 can teach you the ropes, uh, or you start on your own. And so, and then in, in our profession, you have two options. You go cash practice or you go where you're collecting health insurance. So of this Punnett square, which is start on your own, get hired somewhere, cash practice, insurance practice, the hardest of the four is to start on your own cash practice. And that is of course, what I chose to do. <laughs> and it was, it was kind of a debate, but not, I always knew I was gonna do it. And it, it, it resulted in me having to move back home. I lived in my mom's basement for five years and I worked about a hundred hours a week for four and a half years. And I did hundreds of things I did not want to do, but I knew I had to do them in order to succeed. And I, uh, it really was a truly miserable experience. And if someone said you had to do it all over again, I'd be like, absolutely not. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll pick one of the other three in the Punnett Square. Um, but what I did learn through all of that was uh, if I had to do it all over again, knowing what I know now, 
I could do, I could do in three, I could do in six months what it took me three years to do when I first opened Oakwood. Uh, I made, I made so many mistakes. I burned so much money. Um, if it wasn't for my family, specifically my mom to be a support group, I don't know how I would have done it again. I would have done something, but I wouldn't have done what I did. And, uh, it, it's led up to now we're, we're five and a half. We turn six next year. Um, we have today uh, agreed to terms and principle with the fitness center right over the, right over the road there to move our practice into that place for, uh, no less than eight, but no more than 20 years. Um, and it's turned into, I have three employees, uh, a front desk manager and two massage therapists. And I, I, I scrape by every month, just, uh, I'm not rolling in it. Like this house, I was, I was able to purchase this house because my mom gave me the money for the down payment. And uh, I've kept every IOU on a napkin in a suitcase that hopefully will, will come back to her and cash in a shoebox. We'll see. Um, but it has been a, 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 a very, very difficult journey. And if I was going to use the word pride for anything, I would say I'm just, I didn't have to. Like I, I, I could have, I could have gone the easy route and I, and, and I probably would have been very successful in any, in any of the ways I tried. I just, I said, no, like I, I'm going to, I'm going to build something with, on, on my own shoulder, with my own shoulders, you know, I'm going to carry, I'm going to carry myself. That might be a little arrogance that. There's a tremendous opportunity uh, for, for people onlookers, right? Like to assume, and we've talked about this off camera, obviously, uh, that you're an overnight success and how, what have you and everything else like this, when it's taken 40 years, it's taken that I, I call you my, you're my Andy Dufresne. Like we're both trapped in the <laughs> I'll be, I'll be uh, red. Dropping and dirt in the yard. Right. right. Like you, you Andy Dufresne, this whole thing, you crawl through a, a football field, long river of shit to get to the part that you wanted, that you earned, that you worked for, that you toiled for. And it wasn't because someone gave it to you as much right. as it was that you were willing to take the hits to get it. And I dude, that's, that's what it's all about, to be honest with from, in, in my in my space what the way I live like I, I genuinely can appreciate that like that matters that you right. were willing to do it your way and take all that went with it so you could have it your way you know I didn't tell you this but I was offered a, a position at lifetime fitness in one of their chiropractic offices and I made it through two rounds of interviews before speaking to the owner and this guy, uh, it's called, it's called, uh, life. Uh, if you go to a lifetime fitness and there's a chiropractor in the gym, mm -hmm. um, the gym doesn't own that practice. It, it, it looks like it same font. It's called like life wellness or something. Mm -hmm. Um, but they contacted me and said, Hey, like you've been in practice for three and a half years. You look like you're doing pretty good. Would you like to consider coming to work for us? And I said, I just said, you know what? Let me just not just shoot it down. Let me see what's up. And I started researching it and it seemed really cool. And they had just built a brand new lifetime fitness in North Raleigh, massive facility, like some ridiculous $20 million spot. Right. And I said, and I said, they, 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 they gave me the offer for how much money I'd make. And in my first year, I'd have been able to pay my mom back twice. And I said, man, this seems awesome. Like maybe this is why I started Oakwood. Maybe I started Oakwood in order to become a, attractive to a major corporation, a major company that's nationwide that is, that is going to put me in a position for, you know, that next level tier of success that maybe I can't achieve on my own for whatever reason. Right. <clears throat> and I, I ended up talking to the owner. We did a zoom uh, and he, uh, he broke it down and he said, all right, well, I like you. Let me send you our, uh, he goes, let's do an audition. We'll do it in a week. I'll send you the new employee packet and go through it and uh, let and, and get ready for your audition. And I said, okay. It, it, at, at this point, everything seemed kosher until he said it was an audition. I was like, I was about mm -hmm. to say, yeah, I was with you. Right. Part. Right. Well, so he sends me the packet and I start reading it on the Oakwood website, oakwoodchiropractic.com. Um, 
I write a, what I have an, I, what is chiropractic um, paragraph? And I, I, I point out with no uh, shame, the seven things you should watch out for when picking a chiropractor. We have a fractured uh, profession. And in the first two pages of this 50 page uh, uh, new employee document, they violated five of them. And I remember I was sitting on my office floor because I was so excited, man. Like I was three and a half years in. Like, Why wouldn't you be, right? Like you're I had, acquired, right? Like, <laughs> yeah, like I'm being acquired. And the, the people I talked to on the phone, they're like, here's what our minimum wage earners earn. And it was, it was something out. It was, it was like, it was like, they put in their pocket six times my gross annual revenue, something I was like, Oh my God. Uh, they, they, they can take any doc they want and they want me. And I thought this was great. But when they, when I went through that packet and it said, you know, here is your script that you are to say to patients. Here is the response you must give. If the here, here's the patient's potential responses, here's the responses that you must give. And as I was going through it, I was like, "This violates every piece of ethical f- fabric I have." It's the reason why I started Oakwood is so I could do it my way, like you said. And I talked to some of my chiropractor buddies, and I said, "You know." And, and one of them, you'd like him. His name's Tyler Bowman, Dr. Bowman. And he said, oh, he goes, so all you got to do is just sell your soul. Just, just, just sell your soul and you'll make $300,000 a year. And I was like, yeah, that's all I got to do. And he said, well, what are you going to do? <laughs> and I called the owner and I, and I wanted to leave it on good terms. And I just said, hey, uh, I appreciate the opportunity, but I can't do it. And I bawled my eyes out, man, because I was still working like 90 hours a week. I was still living at home in my mom's basement. I had no money. I was so, so, I said, there was like, how, how, how hard do you have to work? Like, how hard do you have to work? And my mom, she, 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 cause I told my mom all about it. My mom was so excited. My mom was just, 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 she goes, this is why you work so hard to get this opportunity to, 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 to make more money than you could possibly make doing what you love. And I was like, yeah, that's awesome. And, and then when it, this, when, when I, un, when I lifted the rock up and I saw how ugly it was underneath and I, and I told mom, I was like, mom, I can't, I can't do it. Like, I, I just can't. And, uh, she said, uh, she's held me in high respect for that. Cause she goes, Michael, you could have sold out and you'd have made, you'd have made, I'd have made Jay. I would have made more money in that first six months than I lost in the first four years running Oakwood. It was amazing. And so that was a pretty, pretty important moment because that also went to show me that I was doing something right. Because if that's what it takes to get a multi, you know, multi, multi-million dollar practice and you have to, like, bro, this script was just atrocious. They, 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 it didn't matter. It was, it was actually, it was actually quite clever. It's very ingenious, very, uh, 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 what is the, the bride movie? Um, the princess bride, you know, that really tricky guy. Like he yeah. was very, it was very, you know, uh, which, 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 uh, goblet is the, is the poison in and he talks himself into it. Right. It, it was very smart. Um, and so I had to give them credit. I was like, well, no wonder. But also they have a thousand people a day walk right by their front door. And so they don't even have to work to get new patients. But the doctors, it doesn't matter what, did, what you walked in with. If you walked in with a sprained ankle or a headache, they were going to make you sign up for 60 visits, max out your insurance and max out your copay and max out your out-of-pocket. And every single person, there was no alternative. There was no exception. It, it didn't matter who you were. It didn't matter why you walked in. If you walked in, their goal was, squeeze every last drop from the rock. And I just, I'd hate myself. I was like, there's not enough money on the planet to make me want to do that every day to take advantage of somebody that's in pain. Like, like, you know, it's very different. If someone buys a a lemon from a used car dealer, you'd be like, dude, that's life. You went to a used car dealership. Like that sucks, you know, chalk it up, go on to the next one. But if you walk into a doctor's office and they take advantage of you being in a, in a, in a position of discomfort. There's something about that, that I just, it actually makes, it actually makes medicine for profit very difficult because there is, there is one, there is one very key stone in that bridge that that is unethical. 
And the example I use is if somebody's drowning and you have a life preserver, but you will only give it to them if they can pay you. But and if they and if they can't and if they can't pay you, you don't give them the life preserver, right? Yes. Is is that ethical? I mean, a hundred percent, not a hundred percent one way or the other, but it's not a hundred percent one way or the other, right? Because no, no, no. It's, I, I would say, I would say you could argue that eth, the level of ethics, not the morality, like to right. me, that, that's morally, right. morally but, correct. But who would do that? I mean, who, who would, who would, you know, especially if there was a, like, imagine if the person that went swimming, if they signed a waiver that said, Hey, if you drown and you can't afford a life preserver, no one will give you a life preserver and they sign it. And then they're still drowning. Right. Damn. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, do you know the balls you have to have to say, well, that sucks. That shit. I, I got your life preserver on in the boat. You know, it's like, what? I mean, it's what? right here, though. So, dude. And it's not, it doesn't cost me anything to give it to you. No. Yeah. I it, dude, it's, I couldn't do that. It's a, I it take all the mirrors out of my house, but I couldn't look at myself. No kidding, so. man. That's a, that's a rough deal. Like the whole way. I can't even. Dude, that's a hell of a decision. I mean, that's really no. Obviously, I I know for me and obviously you, like that. There's really no fucking. There's no decision, but still, that was it was it, it was it was. However, I mean, I did sit there and I was like, could I do? I did. I did fantasize. Could I do it? And, and I read the script and I was like, and <laughs> and 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 uh, every at the top of every page was if you deviate from the script by more than one word. Uh, you must start over. Like, bro, they, 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 this was, this was a pretty aggressive, uh, to the point where I, 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 I look poor. I look down on some chiropractors and the way they run their practice. And, and, and if I, if I find out that anyone works at a lifetime fitness, I just say, man, that sucks for you because you're just, you have to just hate your job. And I don't care. Like, it, like it, at what point is it not what you're right? Like this, this life journey, we're all on know, it. Like bro. this life journey, we're, we're all on. I've always looked at it, not for what I get from it as much as what I'm becoming. Right. And I could, oh man, the, the, the thing I would have to become would, would to your point, like I would, yeah, I couldn't, I don't, I, yeah, that's not something like, it's fascinating how it's fascinating how when I turned that job down within three months, Oakwood found a tipping point, and we started. I had to go buy black sharpies for the first time in four years because I had I finally could be in the black ink, and uh, it was it was just kind of cool, you know. I make fun. The first the first pack of black sharpies I got, I actually had to pay, it put me back in the red, so I get the red sharpies back out. But but we're there, you know, like we're there. So <laughs> I, love it, I love it. So, so you, busted my home. You that turnaround, this voyage that you're on, we've now, right? Like now we get to kind of start closing the circle. You have a new project that is, it brought you out here, which I'm already, I was already jacked up for. Got to see you, got to, got to have you over and everything like that. Tell, tell me a little bit about Vegas now. So Vegas now is a... Vegas now is, 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 uh, it, it almost doesn't make sense. Um, we'll give a little, let me tell you how this all came to be. This is a really fun oh, story. Yeah, go ahead. So when I, um, I gained about 30 pounds when I finished chiropractic college and I, I graduated in the same suit I wore when I matriculated and the suit was much more snug uh, it, let's say, um, and not in a good way. And so when I, when I opened Oakwood, I realized that I was not physically in shape. Uh, I was not physically healthy. And so I said, I got to fix that. If I'm going to be a doctor of health, I, I have to be healthy. So I said, okay, I'm 36. I've never in my life had to worry about gaining weight or being overweight or worrying about what I eat. But you know, in your thirties, that you're not, you're not 18. You can't just eat whatever you want anymore. So I started working out. I started exercising and I started to do more research as a healthcare physician with what is exercise physiology? What is nutrition? Like, how does this all work? Anyway, I ended up, I ended up cutting the 30 pounds down. Uh, I was as fit as I'd ever been. 
and I, I went and did a bodybuilding show, which was uh, a, an education, mostly because it was the best I'd ever looked in my life. And I finished sixth out of six. And I was pretty much laughed off the stage. Yeah, it was it was very hum- it's very humbling. But yeah, OK, I'm with that. But but um, anyway, then after the show, I, I said I, I've been doing it for like almost two years. And I was like, I'm tired. I want I want hamburgers and I want French fries. And so and so I relaxed a little bit and I went back to just working very hard again, 80, 90 hours a week and eating whatever I wanted to eat. And I gained an, and I gained some of the weight back. I lost my definition. And I said, OK, let's I, I was now 39. And I said, I'm turning 40. And I, and I came up with the, um, the turn 40, look 20 challenge and hired a body coach. I got on a very strict plan and crushed it as hard as I could and spent seven. No, I spent, I spent 10 months preparing and like seven months prepping, uh, for what I considered to be my, my, my body show was my one week I was going to spend in Las Vegas last year, uh, when I turned 40. Well, because I'm me, and this should not surprise you at all. Uh, the birthday party was in June. And around January, I was like two months into this body program. I was seeing results. And I was like, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look cut. I'm going to look great. <sighs> How am I going to document this? And so I said, you know what? I'm going to hire a photographer. I'm going to hire a photographer to follow me around for four days and take pictures and take video and have it professionally done with on professional equipment. And I don't care what all the haters say. Once they found out, there was a lot of them. Funny how all the haters though hate on it until the pictures come out and then they all ask for the link. That was pretty, that was pretty, it's pretty satisfying. Well, bro, I put I spent five bucks and I put an ad on Craigslist in Las Vegas saying photographer needed for four days in June. Assume it's from 10 a.m. to midnight for four straight days. Just assume that. Just assume that. So bring your own equipment. I have nothing for you. I'll pay for all your food, all your beverage. You're on the job. Don't get wasted. If we go somewhere that costs money, I'll pay your cover. And I will give you $1,000 cash. That's $250 a day. That's not a lot of money for professional photographers. But I also didn't want a, 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 a Hollywood director, right? right? I wanted, I wanted a photography student at UNLV who's 22 years old and he's got, he's never, you know, a thousand dollars. It's like, and I don't have to, and it's not going to cost me anything. I'm in. Right. And so I get three or 400 photos taken with the kid who knows what he's doing. And I'm, this is what I'm looking for. I thought I was going to get two or three options. I had 50 photographers respond to my ad. Damn, dude. Yeah. And I agreed to do it with one photographer because his, 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 his response was solid. A lot of them, though, were just, hey, I'm interested. Here's my Instagram. And, you know, I mean, it's like, okay, I'll just put you on the list. But, you know, I'm not, didn't. Anyway, uh, along comes Carl. Carl's going to be the focal point for the next good 10, 20 minutes here. So Carl sends me a reply and he goes, and his, his opening word is cheers, Mike. And I'm already happy. And, uh, He goes, I read your ad. I'd very much love the opportunity to do this project. If you don't mind, please take a look at my resume below. Jay Smith, this man gave me a photo resume that included selfies of him with no less than 30 A-list celebrities, such as George Clooney, Cindy Crawford, Sean Claude, Sylvester, Arnold, Wesley, it, 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 uh, Schiffer, Joel, on the 50-yard line of the Super Bowl, taking pictures of gold medalists at the Olympics. And it just kept going and going and going. And I was like, what, what, who, what? And I, had to, and I replied to him and I said, Carl, I just want to make sure you understand that this offer is for $1,000 total, not $1,000 a day, because you seem grossly overqualified. And he said, my friend... Let me bring my wife and, and, and cover her expenses as well. I will gladly take your thousand dollars for the four days and I will buy my wife a thousand dollar bottle of wine. And I look forward to making your trip to Las Vegas a memorable one. And I said, all right, Carl, uh, you're hired. 
And this is this right, is right. Like I don't have any. I can't even. I'm pretty good. I can't even <laughs> and I'm yeah. I'm like and 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 Carl. He makes fun of me to this day. Every three weeks, I was like, "Hey, Carl, June's approaching. Are you still showing up?" And it would take him a day or two, and he'd be like, "Sir Mike, I sure am. I'm just looking forward to it. We can't wait." And he makes fun of me. He goes, "Mike, he kept thinking I was going to catfish you." I was like, "Carl, did you see your resume?" What are we doing? I would. That's what I would. That was the first thing I would have thought. Yeah, let me line somebody else up. So yeah, I did. I did have one guy on standby just in case. Um, so Jay, uh, first day rolls around, 10 a.m. We're at the Mirage Pool. I saw you that day before we. I saw you the day before that. Remember when you came? To, yeah. So, so the next day was the first day that Carl was going to be involved, and uh, I, Carl shows up and he and he phones me for the first time and he calls me. And goes, Mike, my wife and I were here at the front of the pool, and I'm like, let's see how this goes. Walk up. Here's Carl, guy who's like six foot two, skinny. He's wearing all black, long sleeves, long pants. Uh, white guy. His wife is like five foot one, Vietnamese, like Thai, like, and the deepest, thickest Thai accent that you can have. So she was born and raised in Thailand. And I'm looking at him and he's got a pull cart. And in this pull cart, I find out is around $30,000 of equipment. And so I let him in, we go to the cabana and I'm like under the impression he's just going to start going like click, click, click. Right. And, and he goes, all right, I'm going to mic you up. And I, and I said, you're going to do what now? He goes, I'm going to put a microphone on you. I was like, why? We, what are you doing? I was like, aren't you going to take pictures? He goes, this is a 6K camera. We take the stills from the video. I was like, uh, okay. Obviously. Said, I mean, obviously, I mean, yeah. What, what else are you going to do, right? I didn't, I didn't know if you do too, <laughs> so I was just going to, right, okay, okay. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I know, I know, I'm, I'm slow to, to, to realizing all this. So Carl mics me up, and he hands me a microphone, and on the microphone is a flag that says E Entertainment, and uh, and he says, he says, yeah, I work for E. He goes, this is the one we use when we do remotes, and I'm like, I'm, I'm just, I, I get, like, dude, I'm, I'm overwhelmingly floored. I've got a, mic, I got, I got a wireless mic on. Susie comes up, starts doing my makeup, and I'm, I'm, I'm like, I'm looking around, I'm like, is someone seeing this? I, I don't know what's happening. And so, uh, yeah. And so within 10 minutes of him showing up, he's like, all right, interview your friends. I'm like, okay. So, and so I just, I'm just going with it, Jay. I don't know. I don't know what the hell's happening. I was like, I'm just going with it. So I got this, this E entertainment microphone. The next day he gave me an MTV microphone that he, he got from downtown Julie Brown. If you remember her from way Absolutely. back, like yeah, yo the MTV raps. Yeah. Yep. The exactly. Started back. Right. So he had an MTV microphone. He had, he had an uh, ET Entertainment Tonight microphone flag. He had all these microphone flags that he used when he was a producer on all those shows. And so I'm going around and I'm just, I'm just having a ball, bro. I'm just like, I'm interviewing my friends as though like they're celebrities and I'm just me being a jackass. And we, we just go around and around and we're just doing this. And then every now and then Carl be like, all right, mic off. We need you in the pool. Go to the pool all right all you walk through the waterfall okay all you look at me okay now you and bad news photo okay you and your friends photo all right good now let's go back to uh, i want you i want you to interview the people in the cabana next to us because they're all interested in what we're doing and and and, and i'm just kind of like what like what's going on this makes no sense uh and we did the first day like that and then the next day was basically a repeat of the first day which was mirage pool cabana Carl shows up and he does the same thing. He says, all right, get mic'd up, make up. I'm like, I don't know what's happening. And we go about a couple hours and I, and I looked at Carl. I was like, Carl, what are you doing? Like, what are you doing? Like, what's your objective here? Right. And he goes, he goes, oh no, it's, he goes, well, this is my project now. He goes, I'm going to make a video, a birthday video about you turning 40. And, and I'm just like, but I just wanted photos. He goes, that's lame. I'm going to make a video. Uh, you don't have a choice. I'm going to make a video. I was like, okay. Uh, okay. And then uh, later that day he said, and again, bro, like I'm just having fun. Like I, I've just, and I've got the microphone. I'm walking around. I'm just being myself and doing what I can to just take it all in and, and, and understand what's going on here. 
And all of a sudden he goes, Mike, have you ever thought about being a TV host? And I, and I looked at him, I was like, Carl? Yeah, but the same way I think about winning the Super Bowl. Like, same way. It's a, it's, I mean, it's a dream, right? It's like, I'd love to win. I, I just, I imagine like throwing a touchdown at the Super Bowl to win and I'm going to Disney World, right? Like, he, like what, what guy, well, who doesn't think about that, right? But, but who puts pen to paper and be like, I'm going to win the Super Bowl, especially at 40? I mean, right, what, right, right. So I'm like, okay, yeah, sure, whatever. And he goes, you should be a host. He goes, you're better than 98% of the guys I've, I've filmed. And, and this is a gentleman who's been doing this for 45 years. He invented Eliminate. He has directed over a thousand episodes of The Bold and The Beautiful, Young and the Restless, one of those things. He's done it in James Bond movies. The guy's like, you, you remember his resume. So he's, he's legit. I looked him up. He has no social media, but his IMDb page is legit. And so I'm like, what the hell's going on? Um, <laughs> and so Carl just keeps doing his thing. He sets up a, a, a studio in my hotel room. Backdrop, lights, cameras, mic'd up. He did one-on-one -on -one candid interviews with everybody to, in order to make this a video about how I decided to turn 40 came to Vegas, how it came to transpire and, and, and what it meant to me. And, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm kind of looking, I was like, you know, I'm only paying you a thousand. And, and he goes, and in fact, to his, to his credit, and a little bit, it was very funny. He, his only, he came back with only one pushback, which was, I want $250 a day at the beginning of the day. And, and I was like, that makes sense because, you know, at the end of four days in Las Vegas, you could have no money, right? So I'm like, okay, he wants to make sure he gets paid. And every single day I walked up to him and I would hand him the 250 cash. He, 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 would, he would take a second, he'd be doing whatever he was doing on his camera or whatever. And he would turn, he would look at me, he would look at the cash and he would say, oh, oh, okay. And then take the cash. Like, like if I hadn't done that, he, he would have forgot that he didn't get paid. Uh, of course, I've looked at the guy's personal self-worth. That money I got, I understand why. He, he actually may have used my 1000 to just put it towards a $4,000 bottle of wine. Um, that he said it because it was a business. It was just a, a standard business practice of his behalf. But I, I really actually don't think, I really don't even think he wanted the money. Like, he, he wanted the money. He Because, right. Jay, I've, I, I, he... <laughs> I think it's public knowledge, but he invented, do you remember Eliminate uh, and Blind Date? You know, there's those two reality dating shows, right? So he invented Eliminate. He sold it to Warner Brothers for $29 million. Yeah. So yeah. That's and that's just, that's his, that's his biggest sale. He's got, he's got 21 others. Like I'm pretty sure it's public knowledge. I'll make sure before you air it, but I, I, he, he told me, he told everybody. So it's, I don't think he's, he's, he's hiding that at all, but also it's, it was a, those those Hollywood deals, like you know how much somebody makes for, for being the lead star actor in a movie, you know oh, you can learn sure, what they yeah. make. Yeah, so it's same same. Um, well, anyway, so then we wrap filming, um, and he hits me up and says we need just a little bit more to do your birthday video. So can you come back to Vegas for a couple of days and we'll do a little extra shooting, try and bring your same wardrobe, try and keep your hair the same length, try not to gain too much weight. And I was like, all right, whatever, let's go. And so I went back for three days. Um, this was all under the radar. I was just, I just was there from like a Monday to Thursday and we went and did a bunch of other stuff and had a lot of fun. And he had me do voiceovers and some studio work. And on day two, he said, so about you hosting that TV show, and I, and I, I was like, well, what, what does that entail? And he said, well, what would you like to do? I said, well, I love Las Vegas. Like I didn't make Las Vegas, but Las Vegas made me. And so I said, okay. He said, well, what if, what if we did a show highlighting the hidden gems of Las Vegas? And I said, yeah. Like also we started thinking about it. No one's done that. Right. No. And so, and so, he comes up with this idea and I said, so what would I have to do? He goes, you just got to be yourself. He goes, you know, that stuff you did for four days with your friends. He goes, just do that. And I'm like, uh, okay. So what do we have to do? He goes, well, he goes, I got a producer. I'll be the director. You be the talent. Susie, his wife will be, you know, a, a production assistant. He goes, we have all the equipment because you just pay to come back out here in a couple months and we'll just figure out how to go, we we'll just come up with ideas. And I said, okay, uh, I can do that. So I, I go home and I start talking to the, to the producer. His name is Marlon for the conversation. So it's Carl Marlon and Mike. 
and we, 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 we dubbed it the CMM production company because, you know, we had to call it something. And I talked to Marlon. I'm like, Marlon, bro, how many days do you think we need? He said, I about, he said, I probably need seven, eight, nine, 10 days. It's like, okay, let me find a few days. And, um, and I found a few days and the more and more I'm getting to know Carl, Carl has lived a life of sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And he's he now did his, what he had to do. And he has, uh, he is living with the results of, of living a 50, you know, five decades of sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Well, and I mean, I can't fault him. All I can do is be jealous. So we picked nine days and just told Carl, I was like, Carl, I'll be here from this Tuesday to this Thursday. And Carl was like, fantastic. Let's come up with some set. Let's come up with some shooting ideas. We came up with a dozen locations, including three separate million dollar estates that's three million and eight million and 18 million uh we found uh la casa at tivoli village which is a small speakeasy scotch a cigar bar we found uh, uh a gentleman who's considered the master of craps the, 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 the platinum craps uh expert um so we, we went and shot with him um we went and shot a machine gun off a of humvee on in at, at pro gun vegas on the south side um we went to the strip and just basically like ambush interviewed people just on the strip. We did it at Fremont street as well. Nice. Um, and then we went and got, it was amazing how many, how many people we got shut down from uh, that were just, I guess they were just nervous cause they never heard of us or whatever. Um, but uh, we had a lot of places that were interested, but just, they just couldn't pull it together because I think they thought that something was wrong or I don't know, maybe they, I don't know. It was oceans, oceans 14. I don't know. Um, but they, so we go for nine days, bro. And we're networking every day. We're just talking to people. And it turns out that the owner of the $18 million mansion, he owns the all-star exotic car sales and rental dealership just west of the stadium, the, the Raiders stadium. Right. And, and when we were, when we were at his house, Carl and this guy start to get to talking and it turns out they did a project together, but they didn't know it because there was like 400 people on the, on the, on scene. And, uh, and, and the gentleman of the house to prove it, he, he pulled up a picture on his phone and he, and he went like this and he went, he went, he went, see, here I am on site. And Carl looked at it and Carl goes, yeah, I took that picture. And that's when the gentleman of the house said, well, do you need any exotic cars for your shop? Just, if you need one, let me know. I'll let you have one. And I'm, I'm like behind Carl and I peek around him and I go, yes. <laughs> yes, we do. As a matter of fact, yes, so, we do. Not, not until this very moment. Yes, we do. So we ended, we ended shooting with a, uh, a trip up and down the strip in a Ferrari 48 Spider. Um, top down, there's a, a, a mini SUV to my left, two cameras hanging out the window. I'm mic'd up. I'm talking to the cameras. I'm talking about the strip as we're driving down the strip. And we go, we go from Mandalay Bay to Wynn. We U-turn. We go from Wynn back to Mandalay Bay. And then um, because the dealership was closed, we only had this car for two and a half hours. Because the dealership was closed, we had to re return the car to his $18 million estate, which is 25 minutes south of the strip by 8 p.m., um, I was, his main point of contact was his wife who was an absolute, absolute sweetheart. And she was so accommodating and so nice. And she said at, at exactly eight o'clock, she sent me a text and he goes, are you here? And I said, no, ma'am, I am 10 minutes away, but I'm driving the speed limit and I have my seatbelt on. And, <laughs> and it was one of the, it was one of the more intimidating rides of my life because I'm, I'm driving a $300,000 car that oh, if, house. Yeah. So, and if I get in an accident, I only have liability. So, yeah. Let's let's <laughs> let's 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 drive slow. <laughs> so, uh, Vegas now production. The pilot, um, according to Carl and Marlon, they're going to have it cut within forty-five days. It's now been two weeks, so hopefully, within the next thirty days. And Carl is under the impression that he will be selling this show to any network that will pick it up. And he has a minimum price tag uh, for this show because Carl knows what he can produce. And uh, 
and he knows that we are small. We're small. There's only three of us, so we don't have to. We don't have to split the pie in big ways. And if we get a modest offer, introductory offer from Netflix, Hulu, Amazon, I mean, hell, Crackle, Now, like Discovery. It doesn't matter. Like Discovery could pick us up and put us on Travel Network, ask for 26 episodes and six bonds, and they would cut us a check for five million. And Carl is like, "That's standard now." I'm like, "Okay." And he goes, we take a million off the top for production. We cut 4 million three ways. And then we make 26 episodes in six weeks. And I'm like, oh, just like that? I mean, I had that written down in my notes. Yep. See? That's all? Written down in my notes, yep. (laughs) It's like, that's all we do? Okay. So uh, we're, bro, I I don't understand how this all came to be. Um, I've had a couple people... um, to, to kind of come back to uh, I've had a couple of people say, you just got lucky. And they're like, well, you were just in the right place at the right time. And, and, and well, you, it could have been anybody. And I, I've, I've had to, I've had to quietly, you know, if they're hating, I just let them hate. But if they're asking, I say, you know, to your, to your point you made earlier, it took me 40 years to become an overnight success. And everything I've done has led up to me having an opportunity to interact with a Hollywood, a Hollywood director of 50 years who was then exposed to just me being me. And then he said, I can take a risk on you. Yep. That, that wasn't, that's not the same thing as you're just walking down the street, you know, and then you just get pulled <laughs> off and they're like, you need to be back. Man, you know, and he's just like, it's like, that's, that's not what happened. It's, it's that I worked really hard to, I worked really hard to learn. You taught me, you taught me at, at, at the pit of when I couldn't get that job in my, in my mid twenties, I couldn't get another bar job. And I had, I got that job at that pseudo Metro gay bar, whatever. And I was so worried that people would think I was gay and you, you, I don't know why, other than the fact that I'm 25 and insecure. And you, you said real quick, it's like, you need to be yourself. And if anyone makes fun of you for it, fuck them. And it took me 10 years to truly start living that every day because it's a very difficult thing to do. Because if you are yourself and someone rejects you, there is nothing you can hide behind, which is why many people front who they are is because if I don't, if I pretend to be someone else and someone doesn't like me, I can, I can deflect it because they're not actually you, you don't know. know me anyway. Yeah. Right. Exactly. But if I am myself and someone rejects me, there is no, that's the buck has stopped. And that's a very, very hard thing to do. But what you have to be able to do is understand that not everyone is going to like you and you better be yourself because then if someone does, then you don't have to wonder why they like, you You know, cause they like you for who you are. And that, that took, dude, that took 50. I'm still getting good at that. But I think it's one of the reasons why Oakwood has become so successful. It's because when people meet me, I am myself and I'm not the right doctor for everybody, but I am myself. So when someone likes me, they like me for me. They don't like me because I'm pretending to be someone that I'm not, which I would have had to do if I got took that job at the Lifetime Fitness Place. I would have had to pretend to be someone else. And, 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 and now we're all living lies. And, yes. you know, but in order for me to get to that point to where I'm like, you know what, I'm going to be me. Mm-hmm. And if you don't like it, it will hurt. See, that's, that's something that's very difficult. I, I think it's this misnomer. It's like, um, um, it's this, this misconception of I'm going to be myself. And if you don't like it, then fuck you. True, but it hurts to be rejected. Re- getting, re- right. re- getting, getting rejected is not, it's not fun. It's not easy. And it's never really a, 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 a comfortable pill to swallow. So When you say just be yourself, be like, yes, but then you have to, then you have to be able to balance out. If someone rejects you for who you are, you have to learn how to grow from that. Because when someone accepts you for who you are, the the reward for that is 10x the consequence of being rejected for who you are. Absolutely. And and to to your right, like to piggyback off that, uh, I've I felt the or feel. Right. As it were, it, there's a piece. Yep. It's uncomfortable. To your, yes, absolutely. It's uncomfortable. It, it feels terrible in any scenario to be rejected. Right. But the thing that gives me peace 
is I know there's nothing I can do. Could do right. This is this is me. This is me. This right. is not. I'm right. not going to be. I can, it can elevate it. It can obviously d- devolve, unfortunately, in some spaces too. But it's still me. I'm. I have a peace. I know that you're you're not for me. I'm okay with that. I I wish it were different. I saw some things of you, right? Like I saw some things of you that I thought would work really well with what I got going on over here. That we would have right. made a great right. sound together. But at the end of the day, it's going to be better that I didn't. We didn't waste our time here, and we matriculated and, and did our thing. So that that's the part that gives me peace. Well, the nice thing about being yourself all the time, as well, is if you are honest with yourself, you also need to continue to locate trends. And if you continue to get rejected for the same reason that you are yourself, perhaps that's perhaps that you can reflect and say, I wonder if who I am is actually the best version of myself. And so when you're able to get honest feedback, yeah. And you don't necessarily have, to, and, I, and again, it'll cut, it can, it can, it can cut and you can bleed and that's okay. It, it hurts. It's, it, and it's not fun and you don't aim for it. But if, if someone is lashing out at you for who you are out of jealousy, that wound heals very quickly. But if somebody is lashing out for you and you bleed from truth, that wound will never close because that truth will continue to open the wound. And eventually you can be like, maybe I need to change who I am to avoid this wound from main staying open. And again, I think this actually circles all the way back to maturity is not getting smarter. Maturity is realizing all your flaws and doing everything that you can to address them. And it's very humbling and it's very, I mean, it makes you very self-conscious. It makes you, it's embarrassing to, to sit there and be like, Mike, you, you're, 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 you're 40 and you wonder why you're single. And I can say, no, I don't. I know exactly why I'm single. I, I, I have a lot of bad things about me because I get proper feedback because I'm always myself. So I'm trying to fix all those things. Actually, to that effect, I'm, I've, got a, I've got a pretty, pretty uh, steady girlfriend now. I'm, I'm really happy with first time, first time in a while. So, and even she wonders, she looks at me and she goes, why am I with you? I was like, I don't know, but I'm going to work really hard to make it so it's, it's not an easy decision for you to, to, to not be with me. But, um, you know, and like I said, I, I, I still, I still, I still want to be, I still want to keep growing and I want to get better. But dude, if Vegas now takes off, oh my God. <laughs> win, win, win at the win. When? Actually, actually, uh, Carl and Marlon, they had to sit me down and they said, Mike, will you shut your practice down if it's off? And I said, well, I, I, I prefer not to because I'd still like to, I have to, I have, I've been blessed with the opportunity to be able to help people. I'd still like to be able to do that. And Carl said, you're not going to be able to. He goes, you need to understand if this takes off, you're not going to be able to. And we need to know that you're going to be able to make the decision to commit to this full time. Because if you're not, then we need to stop this project right now. And it was a very scary, it was very scary. Um, thousands of hours, tens of thousands of hours I put into my practice. And I am just now reaping what I sowed just in time to shut it down and go be a TV host in Las Vegas. Like how, how freaking serendipitous is that? That I'm, I'm, but Carl has said it many times. And it's one of those things where he's like, Mike, I, you, you, you don't, you don't know because you've never done it before. He goes, Mike, you have it. You have the thing that we need to sell the show. Marlon is a great editor. I'm a great director. We are not going to make this show and not get picked up. It will get picked up by who, for how long, for how much, TBD. But do not think that we are not going to finish this project and it's just going to be a video diary of the nine days you just got to pretend to be a video host, and a TV host in Las Vegas. He goes, that's, he goes, I don't do that. I don't waste my time. He has sold 22 shows. And he said, Mike, you are about to be the host of my 23rd. So I, I'm, I'm putting faith in the project. I'm, it's very fascinating. I have no more to do. I did all, I was on screen. I actually had the easiest job. I, I, I got to just talk and be myself and bullshit and, and just have fun and just act on camera. And now that it's all over, they got to do all the hard 
heard stuff and I, I have no say. Like when the first episode comes out, I don't know what it's going to look like. I don't know. I don't know. Like, it's like, what, what's the first episode going to be about? I was like, I don't know. Like, I, I, don't know. I was That's right. Like, especially right. Like, I, I feel like there's a, a line that, that you and I are aligned with. Uh, we like to be the dictators uh, of, of the right. pace, whatever the pace is. Right. Tell me where we're going. I'm going to tell you the pace and we'll go that right. way. Uh, it's exciting when you don't, when you've already done the work that you're required to do and the thing and you right. just get to wait. You just get, it's like, it's like a, a awesome, terrible Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> where, where you're so jacked because you get it, but you're like, mm, mm, mm. right. <laughs> You got the bike you wanted, but it's not in the right color. It's like, I don't know how to feel. I don't know what to do with this. I'm so, no! I'm so I mean, thank you, but no! Thank right, you. exactly. Wrong. I wouldn't have done that. That's not how I would have. Thank you. That's awesome. Thank you. But that, ooh, yep. <laughs> but, I but I still have to write you a thank you note. Uh, 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 yes, yes. Coming forthwith. Yes. It's just a, a very exciting time, but I'm, I'm, I'm excited for you. I, I really yeah. have. Like, I, I, I don't know of a more deserving uh, Andy Dufresne, right? Like, <laughs> like, I don't know of a person that, that deserves it more in, a, in the effect of what you've, what you've been willing to go through, to grow through, to get here, to be that is incredible. So I'm, I'm humbled and, and, and I appreciate your compliment. Um, I recently looked up the, the etymology of the word deserve uh, because I, I saw, uh, uh, I saw someone say something that they deserved something. And I, and I was like, what does deserve even mean? And uh, the word, the word deserve is, is a, is a, is a combination of two words, day and serve day, meaning of and serve meaning service. And so of service. And so someone who is deserving means that what you deserve is, not just recognition or reward, but it's basically a form of compensation, however that compensation can be interpreted for your service. And where I think people mistake deservation is they think that because they are who they are and they think they're good, they deserve something, that, that their service has led to them to, 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 to them receiving something for their service. And so every time I hear I'm deserved of something, it's very, it's a, it's a, it's a very, it's conflicting because I work very hard and I like to think that I do have service, but does that mean I should be rewarded for it in a fashion that I see fit? Because that's another thing. Some people think that they deserve what they deserve. It's like, I get to choose what I deserve. Right. And, but that's, that's not exactly how that all plays down. And I'm not disagreeing with you so much as I am trying to maintain this continuity of maturity, which is I'm an idiot. I, I have made, I have made for every good decision I've made, I've made a hundred mistakes and you have been privy to most of them. And there. They're, they're humbling and they're embarrassing. And, and, and to some people, they're shocking. It's like, how, how could you think that when all I do is see the successes that you have? And I was like, yes, because I only make it look easy because no one wants to put their failures on a, on a billboard. Um, but the failures shouldn't be forgotten or dismissed, but they also then shouldn't be uh, trivialized when it comes to what do you deserve for the services that you've done. And I hope that I, I hope that you are correct with regards to um, if all of the, the, the fruits that I have, uh, uh, the seeds I've sown, if they've led to these fruits, I hope it's true deservitude only because I don't think I deserve it. Like from a just give me, right? right. From a give, from give me, because I've worked very hard, so give me stuff. Right. And I hope that that I hope that that what I deserve is the the outcome of my hard work organically, as opposed to just oh he did that here give him this he deserves it. Right. So it's a it's it's a it's an interesting. Ooh, it's it, bear with me. I'm with you. 
I feel like what you're saying is to right to a lay person, you want to win. You don't want the trophy. You want the win, like the real win. Right. 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 There's something that you cannot buy. Like yeah. you cannot, you cannot buy, you cannot buy victory. Right. Yes. And cause if you do, it's, it's a form of coercion. It's, it's not natural. It's, 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 dirty. It gets, it's, so it's, dirty. it's cheapened. It's cheapened. It's, it's, you can't even take pride in it. Right. Yeah. Like it's, it's like, I didn't, it's, it's deserved and earning are two very, it's like, if you deserve it, you earned it. And like, that's two, they're two very, those two words very, they, they parallel each other and, and they're very appropriate to be interchanged. It's just, it's fascinating how some people think that, oh, uh, well, if I did this, then I should get that. And right. um, I, I'm, I'm flabbergasted. I'm even sitting here and there's a Hollywood director and producer in they're 10 minutes from me right now who are cutting a 30 minute episode that's meant to be used for future game. Like what, what, what is that? So, and I can't even explain it. I don't even totally, I, that's, that's, I don't know. It's a tough, it's, it's, it's humbling. And I'm hoping that it's, it's not misconstrued as greed. Um, which of course, everyone who's, everyone is going to hate, for whatever reasons they hate, like, you know, is, is that, that's, that's more or less, it's like, Hey, if you're going to hate on me for being myself, that wound will heal very quickly. I um, mean, I'm okay with that. You know? So. Well, brother, I know uh, you got st- like, I'm, I'm glad I could get you before all this goes. Cause I know it's going to go. So before all this goes, I can actually get you for the time. I brother, I love you. You already know this. I love you too, man. Dude, I'm so proud of you. And where you've been willing to go to get to where you're going. I I know how existential that sounds when I say it, but I really mean that. And I know you understand what I'm saying. So I really right. don't care who, who takes this in. But I, I I really, really, really am proud of you. Well, that means a lot because Jay. I mean, I've known one person longer than you in my life. Maybe that's not family. I've known one, one, per, I think Is it maybe two. Yeah. Yeah. I'm coming for that spot. <laughs> well, uh, other than him, because I met you around this, like, I think I met you and Pete about the same time. Um, and Eric. So those guys, yep. uh, yeah, but it's, it's you and Jay, uh, you and I, uh, our friendship, we've been through hell and back, man, all seven rings twice. Oh. And, you know, and, and what I, what I, what I, what I think I value about you the most is no matter how much we've disagreed or argued or fought or whatever has come between us, whether it be, um, money or people, um, I, I, I think that you and I have both been able to, while we see differences and while we might not agree, and, and we're coming close to going toe to toe. Uh, I, it, it just feels like we both acknowledge the respect that we have for each other because neither of us is being underhanded, nor are we trying to do, there's no Trojan horse. No. There's, no, there's no sleight of hand. There's just sometimes just straight up, just head butts, which, I mean, that's, that's you know, I, I've had some friendships that, that fell apart at the first sign of struggle. And you and I have been able to struggle for 20 years and, and maintain this, this, this bond that I think is just, uh, I, I think it's a special thing. And I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not sure what I did to deserve it, but my man, I, I, I really am, am happy that we have made it through all this. So. Absolutely. I look, I look forward to being at the fucking premiere. I'm going to be absolutely nuts. <laughs> it's going to be nuts. I'm going to be nuts. I'm letting you know, but you already knew. <laughs> but your, your invite's already in the mail. So let's oh, just God. thank you, bro. I appreciate it. This was a lot of fun. Hopefully we can do it again sometime. Oh, absolutely. Oh, trust me. When I can get you after we, you get, oh, oh buddy, this is going to be ignorant. I'll, I'll wave. I'll, I'll wave my appearance fee next time. 
So I appreciate that. I appreciate that. <laughs> well, this has been another episode of From the Root to the Fruit. I've been Jay Smith. You've had the pleasure of listening to Dr. Mike Finneran. I love saying that. It rolls <laughs> off the tongue. I wish somebody was in here so I could slap the shit out of them. I love that. <laughs> take care of yourselves and take care of each other. Cheers. <laughs>